The films of Cartoon Saloon have always left a deep impact on me. Not just because of their beautiful animation and emotionally moving stories, though these elements alone make the films worthy of praise, but because of the history and culture that is incorporated into almost every film they create. Though not completely historically accurate, their films do an amazing job of taking elements from Irish history and culture and incorporating them into new and original stories. And The Secret of Kells, Cartoon Saloon's first feature-length animated film, is no exception. Released in 2010, The Secret of Kells tells the story of Brendan a young boy living at the Kells Monastery, an isolated outpost in medieval Ireland. Though Brendan is dedicated to helping the monks with their work, creating and copying manuscripts, the abbot of Kells, fearing the threat of outside invaders, encourages them to instead spend their time improving the monastery's defenses. But things begin to change with the arrival of Brother Aidan, a master illuminator from the island of Iona, who sequesters Brendan's help in completing the fabled Book of Iona, aka the Book of Kells, an illuminated manuscript which he believes has the power to bring hope to their troubled times. While working to complete the book, Brendan encounters fairies, ancient monsters, and vicious invaders that turn his once quiet world upside down. Despite the important role it plays in the story, The Secret of Kells never explains what the Book of Kells actually is, preferring to instead focus on the manuscript's beautiful artwork and vibrant history. While this information was omitted on purpose by the creators, who didn't want to put too much emphasis on the book's religious significance, there are a few facts about the book that I feel are worth mentioning. First, the Book of Kells is an illuminated manuscript that records the four Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. While the Book of Kells is famous for its beautiful illuminations, the book's text is less impressive, with spelling errors, missing words, and various instances of repeated text, all of which seems to add credence to the theory that the book was a ceremonial relic rather than a text intended for serious study. While scholars are unsure of the book's origins, whether it was created on Iona, Kells, or both, in the film, we're told that the Book of Kells was commissioned over 200 years earlier by St. Colm Kill, the founder of the Iona Monastery. While it's true that the Book of Kells was long believed to be the work of St. Colm Kill, this is no longer the case, as most scholars now believe that the book was created sometime during the early 9th century, over 200 years after Calm Kill's death. From this, we can infer that the Secret of Kells also takes place sometime during the early 9th century, a fact which is further evidenced by the film's reference to the sacking of Iona. While the Iona Monastery was attacked several times during the late 8th and early 9th centuries, in 806, a Viking assault decimated the island, resulting in the death of 68 monks and forcing most of the monastery's remaining residents to return to Ireland, where they established a new monastery at Kells. In the film, however, not only is the monastery already completed upon Brother Aidan's arrival, sans the outer defensive wall, it's also implied that Brother Aidan is the only surviving member of the Iona Monastery, which is pretty dark considering the film's PG rating, though I can understand that the filmmakers probably didn't want to bog down the story by adding too many additional characters, so keeping survivors to a minimum makes sense. The berries that Brother Aiden uses to create ink are actually not berries, but oak galls, ball-shaped growths that generally result from a reaction between plant hormones and the growth-regulating chemicals found in some insects, usually gall wasps. 
The insect in question will inject their larva into a part of the oak tree, often a leaf or a branch, which will stimulate the formation of a gall around the larva, providing it with protection and nutrition until it reaches maturity. So rather than berries, Brenton is actually stealing wasp larvae, which, as the film points out, are fully sentient beings capable of understanding human speech. I asked them not to sing it. Well, this just got really dark. Putting the issue of baby wasp murder aside, Iron Gall Inc., which is produced by combining iron salts with galatanic acid from the oak galls, was the most common type of ink used in the Book of Kells. While the colored inks used to create the book's illuminations were created using a number of different substances, including gypsum for white, lichen for pink, woad for blue, and opramint, aka arsenic sulfide, for yellow. This information isn't relevant to the video, I just thought was really interesting. Unfortunately, Viking Raiders, or Northmen as they're called in the film, found their way to Kells in 1006, sacking the abbey and stealing the book's golden cover before abandoning the rest of the text. Because who has time to read when you're busy raiding villages and burning monasteries to the ground? After nearly three months of searching, the text was rediscovered and returned to the abbey, where it remained until 1653, when, due to the destruction caused by the rebellion of 1641, the text was relocated to Dublin and eventually to Trinity College, where it now resides on public display. Brother Eden's cat, Pengerbon, takes his name from a 9th century Irish poem. While the identity of the poem's author is unknown, being that it was found scribbled inside a book from St. Paul's Monastery in Austria, based on context clues found within the text, we can infer that the author was probably a monk. More than loud acclaim, I love books, silence, thought, my alcove. Happy for me, Pankerbon, child plays around some mouse's den. Pankerbon's name also gives us some insight into their physical appearance, as the word bon, when used as an adjective, means white-haired. Ashling's name, which means dream or vision, in addition to being a possible reference to her mystical powers, is also a type of traditional Irish poetry. As the name would suggest, these poems would often center around a vision or prophecy that the narrator would receive from a mysterious woman or fairy who would come to him during a dream. While the film never makes it clear if Ashling actually has prophetic powers, she still acts as an important source of information for Brendan, showing him around the forest, giving him ingredients to make ink, and warning him about the dangers of Krom Kruak. The excessive amount of white used in Ashling's design is also a clear sign of her supernatural origins, as many Irish myths and legends use the color white as an indicator of the supernatural. So if you ever find yourself in the Irish countryside and you come across a mysterious person dressed in white, then you should probably leave as it's possible that this encounter may end badly, as not every fairy is as amazing as Ashling. The Standing Stone, where Brendan first encounters Ashling, is modeled after the Turo Stone, an ancient monument decorated in the Ten Motifs dating back to around the 1st century BC. While artifacts from the Latin culture, which dominated most of Western and Central Europe during the Late Iron Age, have been found throughout Europe, the Turo Stone was found near a ring fort on Turo Hill in County Galway. Like many figures from pre-Christian Ireland, most of what we know about Crom Cruach comes to us from second-hand sources meaning it should probably be taken with a grain of salt. While we know that Cromcruach was a subject of worship prior to the arrival of St. Patrick, 
It's uncertain exactly why they were worshipped. As most accounts, Tooth instead focused on the massive golden monument that was erected in their honor, and the ritual baby sacrifices supposedly performed there. According to the Tripartite Life, a collection of writings about St. Patrick from the 9th century, Patrick was so offended by this pagan monument, and presumably also the ritual baby sacrifice, that he hid it with his golden crozier, shattering the idol and compelling the surrounding standing stones to sink into the earth. While many people have, understandably, questioned the validity of this legend, others have cited a possible connection between Crom Crook's idol and the Killy Cluggan Stone, an Iron Age stone monument with a ten decorations that was found outside the town of Killy Cluggan in County Cavan. While the exact age and purpose of the stone is unknown, there are a number of factors that align it with the Crom Cruick legends, such as its location, as most scholars now believe that Crom Cruick's idol was located in County Cavan, as well as the fact that the stone was found shattered into several pieces. However, being that a golden statue, or a decorated standing stone, would make for a pretty boring antagonist, the filmmakers chose to instead represent Krom Kruuk as a gigantic snake, an idea which seems to have stemmed from the film's director, Tom Moore, who believes that the legend about St. Patrick banishing snakes from Ireland could be linked to the legend of Krom Kruuk. So, snakes symbolize paganism. Actually, given the Bible, that makes a lot of sense. The magnifying powers of Crom Kruuk's eye and the role it played in creating the Book of Kells are, unsurprisingly, both film editions. Though this part of the film does attempt to answer one of the most enduring questions about the Book of Kells, i.e. how did medieval illuminators create such detailed images. While there is evidence that people in the ancient world had a working knowledge of magnification, for instance, rock crystal lenses dating as far back as the 7th century BC have been unearthed in northern Iraq, the Roman scholar Seneca was able to magnify images using a globe of water, and even Emperor Nero supposedly used a precious stone called Smaragdus to improve his vision, there is no evidence that magnifying devices were used to create the Book of Kells. It's also worth noting that any device capable of magnifying images could also potentially be used to start fires, which is probably not the best thing to have in a room filled with paper. The statues that decorate the outside of Crom Crook's cave bear a striking resemblance to the Boa Island Janus statue. This ancient figure, which was discovered, or rediscovered, in Caldreg Cemetery in 1841, depicts what appears to be two bearded men standing back to back. While the origin and purpose of this statue is unknown, Similar monuments, such as the Lustymoor Island statue, have been found in surrounding cemeteries, which would suggest that these statues represent a figure that was, at one time, well known and possibly spiritually significant. This opens up the possibility that these statues we see in the film are actually different depictions of this same figure, which has become my personal headcanon though it's so so completely possible that I'm just overthinking things. Though The Secret of Kells isn't my favorite film in Cartoon Saloon's animated lineup, I still have to acknowledge all the passion, hard work, and genuine talent that went into making this film. While The Book of Kells probably wasn't the easiest subject to build a story around, especially one intended for a younger audience, the team at Cartoon Saloon 
still manage to create an interesting and emotionally engaging film that is practically overrun with references to Irish history and mythology. If for some reason you haven't already seen The Secret of Kells, then I would definitely suggest giving it a watch along with every other film that Cartoon Saloon has made. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. But as always, I'm Silver Jade, asking you to please remember to support your local library, and I hope to see you again next time.